Mike, hi, how are you? It's great to see you. It's been a while. It has indeed. Yeah, uh, I'm fine. <laughs> how are you? Okay, yeah, yeah. We tend to go quite long periods before seeing each other, but it's great to be in touch again. And um, <laughs> thanks very much for um, to you of the guys at Serpent's Tale for getting me a copy. I wish I was here so early because I was I was so keen to read it, as I always am with your work. And I have to say, I absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. And I'm looking forward to I'm second glad. reading. Well, good. You know, it's, um, it's. I, I have to say, I think I, I'm a big fan of your work. You know, we've met many times and I've, I've talked about your work um, in public and in private several times. And, you know, I, I think it's one of your best books. I really, really think that it's, it's one of the, the sort of greatest things you've done. And I'm biased towards you. You know that. So, but it's just for, for for me and for you you wrote the book you know what it's about i've read it we've had some conversations we, we we sort of on the same page as it were but what i really want to do for my audience is get an impression across to them of what to expect and what not to expect and you know what what the book is about so um what kind of book is wish i was here um i know what kind of book it is um and i loved it as i say so how would you describe it for a prospective reader it's a kind of demolished memoir, um, which I compiled from, uh, I've kept notebooks for 30 or 40 years. Um, many of the notes in them have been in themselves retrospective to, to earlier periods. Uh, so this is 40 years of notes and uh, from notebooks from fragments of uh, failed fiction or failed nonfiction. Uh, journals, yeah. notebooks, uh, various kinds of discards and outtakes from the kind of writing that writers do, which never gets published. Uh, and finally, from, from my blog, which I began to use as a, a public notebook uh, in the mid-2000s, mid around 2007, I think. Um, so I sat down and I I harvested 220,000 words of, wow. of notes um, and then cut repeatedly mm. uh, because what, what I wanted to see was themes developing yeah. um, from out of that mass of material. And as soon as themes did begin to develop and connections between the themes began to develop, then I could see how to bring some order or not huge amounts but some yeah. order to to the fragments um so what can i say about this the 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 content uh there are zombies and other disasters cats yeah. jackdaws hg wells and john windham discussed behind their backs yeah William Burroughs <laughs> makes a real life appearance. I love that. Cakes. I love that Burroughs anecdote. It was it was so refreshing compared to the usual Burroughs anecdote. I thought it was really, <laughs> and it, it did it, did make me laugh. But it was fantastic. I loved it. <laughs> it stuck in my mind, and it's one of my only five or six actual literary anecdotes. Yeah, so yeah. Um, he was a very nice man. Yeah, a very so nice man so indeed. Good. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan, and I think someone you mentioned. Um, in the book is when you were younger how um, important Junkie was to you and how it was a favourite memoir of yours for a long time it's the same with me I you know I discovered it very young and read and reread it so you know I, I I sort of related entirely to what you're saying there so that was a great one so that was one for the readers to look out for and um, and they won't miss it because that was a great one but I love that anyway please continue yeah yeah um, so uh, it's about getting lost it's about constantly getting lost uh, that's one of the themes. Uh, there's climbing adventures. Yeah. Uh, adventures in anti-socially driven cars, which we <laughs> should probably do a veil over. Um, rants, political yeah. rant, fantasies, yeah. political disasters. Mm. Uh, and one of the central themes is the UK as a kind of secret garden, um, uh, right. as an uh, abandoned industrial park. Yeah. Derelict palace grounds full of mouldy follies yeah uh i see it now as a place of self-induced decline and, and hopeless fantasy mm -hmm. um there's at one point there's a desert of used cat litter 
which is yeah. interesting. Yeah, that was good as well. I like that. That was fantastic. Yeah, somebody else yeah. would have made a trilogy out of that. God help us. <laughs> uh, well, compression has always been my thing. You I, know. Know. <laughs> I know. I <laughs> know. If you can get it into two hundred words, is that's, you know that's enough. Why, why write any more? Um, yeah, that's enough. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, I, no expense was spared. It's no, I could tell. Very hybrid. And it doesn't stick to being non-fiction. No, uh, no. In well, fact, that... it, it constantly contours along that line between fiction and non-fiction. Hmm. That's the, the way same. climbers did. Yeah, you put you put um, a subtitle to the book. And I mean, as a bookseller, one of the things I do instantly, it's a novice thing. Whenever you see a subtitle, you know, you know, in theory, except when we're dealing with work like yours, that it's non-fiction. You subtitle the book an anti-memoir. Now, that's a new category, even to an old hand like me, who's, who's always composing little bits of literary nomenclature to sort of, you know, keep things interesting. But what's an anti-memoir, Mike? Well, anti-memoir is... is... I mean, it's a broad term, uh, quite quite recent as as a term. Um, for me, it its roots lie in the in the term anti-novel. Yes. Uh, the the French um, Roman Nouveau. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which which tried to place itself in relation to the novel as a complete opposite. Everything the novel did, it wanted to question. It wanted yeah. to. Yeah. deconstruct take to pieces so uh for me the term anti-memoir would mean something like that but with yeah. with reference to memoir rather than to a novel but i also didn't want to give people the wrong expectations i was looking for yeah. a subtitle yeah. that would kind of package people's direct people's attention or package their attention yeah. away from the wrong expectations because it's not a traditional memoir no, uh, no, and that's the beauty of it as well. I mean, I, I, the, you know, the, when I first um, heard the first murmurings of what you were doing and, and the hints, you know, in um, on on the blog and what have you, I thought, no way is this going to be, uh, you know, Mike sitting by the fireside with the whiskey telling us all the anecdotes, <laughs> which, <you> know, <laughs> which, which we sometimes have enough of on this channel, quite frankly. So you know, we and we've had some fun ones from people like Chris and what have you. But yeah, that. So I knew you to some extent. It was very, very exciting. So to see that coming, and it's weird because something now. I, I, you and I have talked a bit back and forth about about having this conversation. But something that occurred to me last night was um, that you know the, the term metafiction would have been too easy, wouldn't it? You know. I've read some some um, a recent metafiction I read, and I've read plenty, of course. Um, one I read, but I'm not going to name it. It was rather too eager and too blatant. When the best ones are kind of implicit rather than say rarefied. And I mean, a really great one I read a few years ago, and you know this writer, and you know this book is um, first novel by Nicholas Royal, who's um, who's great, great little writer. That was a good one. And although Wish is non-fiction it is writing about writing some of the time isn't it you know so it is it, indeed yeah, yeah. You know, if, if i were to sort of take the devil's advocate point and say you know isn't all writing about writing well indeed um yeah. and certainly most of my writing has has always been about writing mm -hmm. um i think i think of most of my novels as covert metafictions yeah. um yeah. the, the idea is not to entirely hang a shingle out and advertise yourself as writing yeah. metafiction not all the time not every time anyway yeah but, absolutely but to, but to accomplish metafictional ambitions while writing fiction fiction that can actually be read as fiction as it were um yeah but um but i've always trodden the line as i as i said climbers is is a a, a contour a constant contour along the the line between um fiction and and all the uh autobiographical genres yeah that was it. certainly how i read it you know when it yeah. came out in my rereading since uh, i always, always read it that way very much because it seemed to me that just to relate sideways a moment to climb is that you'd looked at it um that sort of topic and what you could do with it fictionally in the ice monkey that story and a nice brief short sharp story and you thought okay how can i take some in real life and make it into fiction and you'd covered that and it was there and it was a step onward from that so um you know having read all your work over the sort of period of 40 years and having seen it evolve you know as i started reading your work in the early 80s and obviously i backtracked to 
to your your early stuff. And I sort of really loved the sort of, I mean, the only way I can say it is the cadences and timbers of the book, the tone colours, really. But, you know, how would you describe the tone of the book to, again, to a prospective reader, somebody who's, who's coming to a book like this for the first time? And, you know, Mike, there are no other books like this. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the plan. The plan was that there wouldn't be a book like it. Um, there's certainly, hopefully, there wouldn't be a memoir like it. Yeah. Um, Tonality is a huge thing with me mm. um, because voice is a huge thing. Yeah. Um, I read I read it aloud to an audience for the first time a couple of weeks ago, mm. um, and it was a deep relief to me to find that it read. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know, it was performable as it yes, were. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and the thing uh, is, Mike, is, is it's easy for you because you're such a good reader. I mean, I'm sure I told you this before. And if, if I if I never did, forgive me. But, um, you know, I didn't want to sort of brag you up too much because, you know, I love your work. But it has to be said, I mean, of all the people I've hosted readings with in Sherd Read, and there are a lot and, you know, world famous people, obscure people, neglected people, people who have their day in the sun or their, their years in the sun. I mean, I've always found you to be the best reader I've, I've ever read. And, you know, that's and that's actually an uncommon thing in writers, you know, the performative thing. You know, you're always really good at that. But I'm glad it came through for you because I know you always like to experiment with that because you did that last time we did an event together when um, You Should Come With Me Now was out. There's a lot of flash fiction in that. I could see in those readings there was an experimental thing about the actual reading itself as well, which was fantastic. Yeah, I think that... Um, I think it's important, and it's certainly important for me since the mid-90s to, to reintroduce or to... Uh, re-acknowledge that that writing is written yes yeah that that writing has become so the writing of novels and especially the writing of generic novels yeah has become so immersive yes that there's a sense as far as i'm concerned of of, of writing having lost its connection to being written mm. <laughs> That, yeah. that essentially for me i think it's a mistake to lose the connection between writing is 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 really the connection between the writer and the reader mm. um if you snap that connection you might as well be making movies yeah absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. and even then you can argue that the movie is a structured connection between the director mm. and and the viewer um so for me reintroducing a kind of performative element um what has been quite important and yeah. i've been involved with guys like tim etchells and his um experimental theater group forced yeah. entertainment um and i've learned an awful lot from those guys yeah. about yeah. how to uh how to capture a room as yeah. it were well, um, I, I've always done it really well from the first, I mean, the first moment I heard you read live was back when we first met the Worldcon in 87 and you read The Ice Monkey. And then when we did our first event together a few years later when Climbers came out, you read Ignaro. And I mean, what, what comes across in your readings? Um, everything in the text comes across. And that's why I, li I like you as a reader. You should do an, you should do an audio book or two. You really should. If they let you, you should really do an audio book or two. Is the humour in your work comes across as well which um, yeah. I think people don't always expect from you, but it's it's always there and it and it comes yeah. across you on the reading. And, um, and you know, I noticed it but before we met, but I think once once we met and once I heard you read, um, I became more acutely aware of that. And it's become a keynote of your work for me. And I've always really enjoyed it. So, you know, so the tone is there. And the other thing about the book is the structure. And as you say, harvesting things, putting them together and um the revise like hell thing which you mentioned to me once before and early in this interview the thing with with the book is that it's very interesting structurally it's episodic and it's fragmentary but at the same time it felt unified so how did you manage to see you know with that bird's eye thing looking at all the different parts that you had 
How did you see the structure of the book? And was it hard to compose all those distinct elements into a continuum? Because it's a continuum that works really well. How did you do it? What's the secret? Well, I can explain, in fact. Um, I mean, as I said, to start with, I started with 200, 250,000 words of, of, of uh, material um, and went through it over and over again looking for themes looking yeah. for for the basic themes i'm an obsessive mm -hmm. so i knew that my obsessive themes would be represented yes um and i knew that they because of the way i write that they would be turned into images because that's that's what i do mm -hmm. and a, a perfect fragment is a single image yes a single almost a single visual image like a painting um for me so i knew that i would find these maybe of the outside 10 basic divisions of the subject matter maybe less mm. um, seven or eight yeah. um so i knew that i was hunting for those and when i found them i allowed them then to accrete fragment to fragment mm. yeah? yeah like like ice gelling out of very cold water yeah yeah um yeah. And that's a process which is very, very difficult to, to describe, except through a, an image again like yeah. that. Um, but that that's for me, that's a process. I've been doing that for 40 years now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I kind of know how to let things begin to yeah. move, move into one another, entangle with one another mm. um, until I until I had the basic themes. Um, and and then. And then I said to myself, well, we will need an overstructure yeah. to manage this. Mm. And it took a long while to find this, the overstructure that I've got. But essentially, there's a central section, which is almost like critical essays about writing yes. yeah. and about my own themes and yeah. other people's themes mm. and about political issues, all related to writing. Because my life has been the life of a writer. If you're going to write a memoir as a writer, mm -hmm. one of the things that you will be writing about is writing. Yeah. So I thought, right, we'll have that as the central section. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, let's bookend that with something that at least resembles a memoir. Right. But yeah. It begins yeah. with early life, Absolutely. which goes yeah. up to about, yeah. I don't know, 20 years old, 25 yeah. years old. Yeah. Um, and it ends with later life. Yeah, absolutely. Now. Yeah. Um, so and though and those that captures the chronological movement mm. of a memoir and it captures the chronological movement of a life. Mm. But at the same time, it bookends the the central subject yeah. matter of, of my adult life which has been we, the act we see you we see you early on in the book and we get these flashes of your memories and reminiscences of yourself and of course our memories are are not always accurate and that's the beauty of it and then we see you moving into being a writer and writing about writing and recent reminiscences i mean on that front there was meant to be a cat where that copy of the sunken land is there was meant there was a cat there earlier on but you know what <laughs> on off. i know you like cats so i wanted my cat to be there but you know she does what they like you know what they're like yeah they, yeah yeah they yeah. do their own thing don't they which is why we they do them. speaking about animals which brings us on to travel and nature and, you know, something I've seen in my book selling job over the last sort of decade or so, there's been this sort of wave of hybrid travel and nature writing. And you've had a lot of acclaim from major figures in that era, people like Robert McFarlane, whose work I really like, and Helen MacDonald. Um, but there's been a massive sort of return to the Richard Jeffries type legacy um, of travel writing in the UK. And it's become a bit of a tsunami, tsunami and a lot of it has got a quasi profound vacuity. You know, there is some good work out there, but there's like an ocean of cliche as well. And so one part of them, um, which you say that you wrote about um, how the word edge lands was becoming one of your least favorite words. And I instantly, instantly related to that because you get sucked into these things. And although I found psychogeography and hauntology very useful ideas doing my reading in my time outside wandering around the real world i can see where the frustration is coming from with this kind of over curating of the found and it's becoming tiresome and safe and you know is is wish i wish you 
a kind of attempt to find a way past this kind of over emoting about environments, whether they're urban or natural, and to find something beyond that. I, I very much felt that it, it was it was trying to sort of deconstruct those things and yet still validate that way of looking at the world. Yes. Um, I mean, to answer this, I have to go on at length, I'm afraid. Please do. Um, Please do. I just did. So the, um, <laughs> for, for me, all this arises from, from early reading uh, and early experience. I mean, the, the book pictures me wandering about in the fields, you know, uh, in a almost Wordsworthian fashion. Um, for me, landscape has always been absolutely central because yes. it was where I fled to when I was truanting. Um, but at the same time, I was reading writers that we would think of, writers like Arthur Macon, um, as early psychogeographers. Yeah. Um, so for me, stories that I was reading, in a sense, solely for their metaphysical thrills, mm. um, were also teaching me how to to write what I think of now as the weird. Yeah. To write to write about writing inside landscape, mm. um, which of course throws back through people like Macon mm. to the Romantics and to the Gothic. Yeah yeah um so that's the first thing to say now, now i think that the weird as, as a modern as a contemporary genre arises totally from the real um and 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 my central example of that would be robert aikman uh aikman's stories come out of the observation of the real the weird in the stories actually arises from the from the real yeah, from the landscape sure. yeah. from the people um so i was always interested in that relationship centrally interested you, know, you read the early fantasies you know you read the pastel city or storm of wings yeah they're actually more interested in the landscape yeah than they are in in the story this is very um, interesting because um i i just had an exchange this morning on on the on the channel with somebody who just read the pastel city and they'd they'd done a kind of freudian slip and they called it the pastel tower and i said and this is because you've connected with the fact that chromis is more interested in not being a sword and sorcery hero and being himself in the landscape than the actual action of the book you know that's the thing yeah 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 so that by the 70s, when I first began to be aware of what would now be called hauntology and or psychogeography and or a mixture of, of, of that, none of this was new to me, in a sense, yeah. this, because this is the way I had lived my life. Mm. And for me, an edge land is just like the landscape of, of when I was eight, nine, 10, yeah. 13, 14 years old. Mm. Um, those were the places I liked to be. I didn't have names for them. That's why I wrote about them. Yeah. You know, yeah I wrote about that experience to try and understand it as an experience and to try and understand myself through that experience. So actually, I don't have a problem with contemporary landscape writing. Right. Um, but I have a critical problem with retrospection nostalgia heritage culture yeah um and there are times that though i see the value of a broken artifact a broken say a broken industrial artifact mm. i don't necessarily see the value in reconstructing it as an art yeah. or as an art yeah. object yeah. or turning it into an art object no, no. Uh, which would then become the centerpiece of the heritage quarter yeah you know yeah. of your town yeah, that old um, rating, yeah, yeah. I find those gestures to be gestures of ownership mm. and that they only really tell us, they tell us nothing about what, what that rusty girder used to be. <laughs> yeah. What they tell us about is is what we want now, what we think now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, to go back to part of your question, I've got no problem whatsoever with landscape described as a collision between inner and outer states of the writer. In fact, you know, I think that's the whole point of travel writing of any yeah. sort, you know. And and again, my my influences there didn't come from from contemporary 
uh, writing, but from writers like Christopher Isherwood mm -hmm. and the great British travel writers of the 1920s and 30s mm -hmm. um, who, uh, who really knew how to write that collision between the interior and the exterior. Yeah. Um, but um, a rusty girder is a rusty girder. Yeah. And that's yeah. its that's yeah. its benefit to the user. Mm. That's why you had the free song when you broke into the deserted factory to look at it. Mm. If you destroy that initial impulse, um, well, you do destroy that initial impulse, that awe and that sense of the sublime mm. as soon as you begin to write it down. Yeah. Um, and this is partly what the book is about, and it's partly what I've been writing about since the 1970s, the late 1970s. I, th I think you have. I mean, the, the part in the book where you where you where you sort of you basically say what you just said, where a, a piece of rusty metal sticking out of a pond is is being taken a lot of times in some bad writing as indicative of an inner state rather than being an example of contingency of a thing in itself. And you know, and to go back to go back, it, it's strange. I didn't think I'd be going back to the pastoral city today to talk to you, but it reminded me of um, I got my old copy out here. Look at that. You don't see many of those these days, do we? Um, and the bit right at the beginning where Chromis has his sword, and um, <clears throat> it's it says he was more possessed by the essential qualities of things rather than by their names concerned with the reality of reality rather than with the names men give it and you know that so that does go back and you've said yourself that you you throughout the 70s you were sort of trying to get to the writer that you became at the early 70s and onwards but he was there pretty much from the beginning and i think i think well the impulse yeah the impulse was there yeah. but i mean i think that's a very naive way of putting the impulse and if i was writing that now i wouldn't yeah, you I would not put it like that yeah um also you do have to remember that that to a degree teguis chromis is a comedy character yeah um his um the rhetoric that i placed around mm. his whole attitude to life was ironic he's clearly a very bad poet for instance yeah, yeah and it was intended to be a bad poet, bad poet. yeah you know yeah. <laughs> um and yeah. and it, so he's in denial of that yeah. he's also in denial of the uh, of his only true talent which is to kill people yeah <laughs> um, and he's also in denial of the fact that he lives in an ivory tower it's it, you know it's not just a tower yeah. it's an ivory tower exactly yeah um yeah. Yeah, and he yeah, needs right. to get alive <laughs> basically i don't think any of his friends tell him get alive you no, know? no 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 um and that's the joke of yeah. that book, which yeah. i opened out in the second volume mm. of the series mm. with with the developed a developed version of the character yeah who's much grimmer and and who has begun to realize the truth which is that he's just a thug yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's funny, it's a Viraconium is a, is a journey and it's interesting. I sort of recommend your books to people all the time. They say, well, there's some interesting things there, but some is quite conventional. I said, well, stick with it. You've got it. Viraconium is a journey. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you've been, you've sort of been, um, you know, what you're, what you've been doing throughout a lot of your work. And I know you've talked about this before, is that the function of the fantastic is to help us escape from reality. It's a bit like Wittgenstein talking about languages and there's a ladder that you climb up the ladder um, of philosophy and then you throw it away you know because you've solved everything and it's 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 taking the fantastic for granted as part of life and I think for me my favorite moment in the Viraconium sequence it sequence is a young man's journey to Viraconium which is then recompleted reconfigured as a young man's journey to London where you know the 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 true essence of what you've been traveling through your development as a writer and this and the sense of story in viraconium and the realization is all moving towards that wonderful point where you know it's the it's the deconst it's the deconstruction of you know why are we interested in fantastic fiction when reality is every bit as strange as we could as we could ever <laughs> wish for and i felt this very much in um in the sunken land which which i was great and congratulations on the goldsmith because well well thank you and it was that thing i was talking to to nina allen um the, when i interviewed nina i interviewed her the other day but we did one we did one back um just after, after christmas and she said you know it's that thing where you're following the characters and I love the whole character study in Sunken Land 
And Nina said, you just want to scream, the fish people are in the background, but it doesn't matter. That's the beauty, isn't it? The strange things are always there. And, you know, that's that's where I find your work, your your work. So, it, yeah. so interesting. And, and that's, you know, and that's so much there in the new book as well. And, that, and that's great. So this this really does feel to me. I don't know whether it felt this way for you, but for me, it felt like, you know, a, a, a summation where you're sort of moving towards this point, And now this is a really great um, place to be at. Um, so you must have a tremendous sense of freedom of being at this point now and what what you can do next and looking back at what you've done. And, you know, we, we do have one elephant in the room we've got to, we've got to sort of talk about, which um, something you brought up in the book in, in, in Wish I Was Sure is you ask yourself the question, you know, the, the old dreaded question that we must cover. Do you, you know, do you identify as a science fiction writer? And, I, <laughs> you know, the, old, uh, the fan base who know your work and love it, you know, we know the answer to that probably in one word. But it does bring us back to um, the Kefahuchi trilogy. You know, was it an opportunity to say, guys, this is how you do it, since that's what we seem to be left with now in SF um, is lots of space opera? Or was it, this is the best way to free myself of the label and to level it to the ground by simply making it complex? You know, what, what was ultimately the motivation to sort of bring that sort of mega trope back and to, and to plunge back into it. What was the motivation behind that? Uh, I think, I mean, I'm possibly will have to go on at length about this too, because it's quite complex. Yeah. Uh, on one hand, it's quite complex. On another hand, it's very simple. Um, I think to an extent you represent my answer to the question, do you identify as a science fiction writer a bit too simply? Uh, although I know what you mean, yeah. um, the answer. If you if you if you look at it, the the answer is a bit more complicated than that. Um, although again, it's framed as a humorous answer. It's yeah. framed as a wry answer. Um, I won't say what it is because that would be a spoiler. Of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that the motive, the motivation for light and its successors was to take what I thought of as the most unlikely vehicle possible, space opera, and deal with all my usual themes and obsessions. Yeah. yeah. Is it I always make myself a problem. I never write a book unless it's from a problem. Mm. I always say, can it be done this way? Mm. Is it is it possible to ram these two completely inconsistent ideas together? What's, you know, and, and I always say to myself, where does the form come from here? It comes from that in, that difficulty, that 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 formal difficulty that I have to solve. So for me, with with light, it was basically how do you write a mainstream novel about the present time mm. and its politics mm. using space opera? How do you do it? How are you going to do that? Um, so it was also that 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 almost contradiction um, added a further difficulty, which is how could I write an outright parody of a standardized form, the space opera, which would still deliver all the excitement yeah. of a space opera? Could you do both? Yeah. Why couldn't you? Why can you not do both? Absolutely. The, yeah. You know, is the question that I force myself to try and answer. Um, I adore massive astronomical objects, <laughs> especially if they're uh, emitting high end gamma radiation. Yeah, I, I know you like your X rays and things. <laughs> yeah, I love spaceships. I yep. love weird and inexplicable science, which at the same time is real science. Yeah, uh, I don't see why I can't make those elements talk about the world we live in now. Absolutely, or its yeah. politics. I don't see why I can't make that a joke, mm. or indeed several different entangled layered jokes, mm. because there are three books there, yeah. and there are an astonishing amount of jokes, mm. many of them philosophical, many of them scientific, and so on and so forth, and they entangle with the motivation, the political motivations of the book, the uh the, the, it it's orientation to to humanity as i see it now um 
I don't see why I shouldn't try to do that, I thought to myself. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So I had a great laugh writing the books, but at the I same time, tell. they're deadly serious. Yeah. Absolutely <clears throat> deadly serious. <throat> I mean, I discussed this with Ian. Um, how do you how do you write something which is essentially a deeply ironic comedy mm. and at the same time deeply and blackly serious? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I think I think it worked. It certainly worked for me. So we are sort of due to the the, uh, the way Zoom is, we're running out of time. But I think we I think we've covered a lot of it there. I think we've covered a lot of the thing in itself and um, and, you know, and where did people's appetites? So the book is out on the 25th um and serpent's tale have done a lovely lovely job it's great stuff so and it's it's great to talk to you again mike and um what i'll do i'll stop recording now we'll have a little chat so um audience thank you very much do go out and get um, mike's new book and as you know we talk about mike a lot on the channel and um it's, it's uh, thanks very much mike for talking to me today and it's great to my pleasure to see you. always great to see you and um i look forward to what's next but i am going to reread wish i was here very soon because i absolutely loved it and i and it's almost certainly going to be my book of the year and um, there's sort of no doubt about that so that's something for everybody to look forward to so i'm going to say goodbye to the audience now <laughs>